Hi, my name is Lynn McTaggart. Welcome to my podcast, Living the New Science. In these early podcasts, I'm covering some extraordinary discoveries by frontier scientists and why this changes everything we think about how our world works and also how we should live our lives. I hope to give you a full understanding of why the world out there can be affected by our thoughts. Today I want to talk about why thoughts can affect things in your life, everything from healing your body to healing other parts of your life. To do that, I have to talk to you about your brain and why, for all its extraordinary capability and um, general abilities, it's also just a little bit dumb. The main reason for this is that your brain cannot distinguish between an action and the thought of that same action. And I'll explain why shortly. This brain blindness has been hugely exploited in sport. Athletes of all varieties now routinely practice what's been called mental rehearsal, or implicit practice, or even covert rehearsal. Focused intention is now deemed essential to alter and improve performance. Swimmers, skaters, weightlifters, football players, all of them employ intention to enhance their level of performance and consistency. It's even been used in leisure sports, such as golf and rock climbing. If you've seen the TED Talk from the famous rock climber Alex Honnold, you'll know that he practiced free soloing up El Capitan in Yosemite National Park endless times in his head before he went out and successfully climbed it. Any modern coach of a competitive sport routinely offers training in some form of mental rehearsal, and often it's touted as the decisive element separating the elite sports person from the second division player. National level soccer players, for instance, are more likely to use imagery than those who remain at the provincial or local levels. Virtually all Canadian Olympic athletes use mental imagery. The techniques involved in mental rehearsal have been exhaustively studied and written about in scientific literature and popular publications. And their credibility was given a further boost in 1990 when the National Academy of Sciences examined all the scientific studies to date on these methods and declared them effective. Psychologist Alan Pavio, who is a professor emeritus of the University of Western Ontario, first proposed that the brain uses dual coding to process verbal and nonverbal information simultaneously. That's probably one reason that mental practice has been shown to work just as well as physical practice for patterns and timing. Pavio's model has been largely adapted to help athletes with motivation or in learning or improving a certain skill set. Athletic mental rehearsal has been incorrectly considered synonymous with visualization. But visualization implies that you observe yourself in the situation as if watching a mental video featuring yourself or seeing yourself through another pair of eyes. Although this may be useful in other areas of life, visualizing oneself from an external perspective in a sports event can hamper athletic performance. Mental rehearsal also differs from positive thinking. Happy thoughts on their own do not work in competitive sports. The most successful internal rehearsal involves imagining the sports event from the athlete's perspective as though he or she is actually competing. It amounts to a mental dry run. Think of Muhammad Ali, for instance, imagining his right fist at the moment of impact on his opponent's left eye. The athlete envisages the future in minute detail as it is unfolding, and from his own perspective. Champion athletes forecast and rehearse 
every aspect of the situation and the steps they should take to overcome any possible setbacks. Rocky Blair, the former running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers, used intention to help the Steelers win the Super Bowl one year. His technique was to saturate his mind with the details of specific plays. He carried out mental rehearsals in the morning, before the team meal, and last thing before drifting off to sleep every day of the two weeks before a game. He also found it reassuring to run through the entire catalog of moves one final time just before the play. While sitting on the bench, he again rehearsed some 30 runs and 30 passes. No matter what the field threw up to him that day, he was determined to be ready. But how can simply thinking about a future performance actually affect the day of the event? Some clues come from intriguing brain research with electromyography, referred to in medicine as EMG. EMG offers a real-time snapshot of the brain's instructions to the body, when and where it tells it to move, by recording every electrical impulse sent from motor neurons to specific muscles to cause a contraction. Ordinarily, EMG offers doctors a useful tool to diagnose neuromuscular disease and to test whether muscles respond appropriately to stimulation. But EMG has also been used to solve an interesting scientific conundrum, whether the brain differentiates between a thought and an action. Does the thought of an action create the same pattern in neurotransmission as the action itself? This very question was tested by wiring a group of skiers to EMG equipment while they were carrying out mental rehearsals. As the skiers mentally rehearsed the downhill runs, the electrical impulses heading to their muscles were just the same as those they used to make turns and jumps actually when they were skiing the run. The brain sent the same instructions to the body whether the skiers were simply thinking of a particular movement or actually carrying it out. Thought produced the same mental instructions as action. Research with EEGs, which is equipment that measures particular brain waves, has shown that the electrical activity produced by the brain is identical whether we're thinking about doing something or actually doing it. In weightlifters, for instance, EEG patterns in the brain that would be activated to produce the actual motor skills are activated while the skill is simply being simulated mentally. Just the thought is enough to produce the neural instructions to carry out the physical act. Scientists have put forward some interesting theories of how mental rehearsal works. One school of thought proposes that mental rehearsal creates the neural patterns necessary for the real thing. As though the brain were simply another muscle, these rehearsals train the brain to facilitate the moves more easily during the actual performance. When an athlete performs, the nerves that signal to the muscles along a particular pathway are stimulated, and the chemicals that have been produced remain there for a short period. Any future stimulation along the same pathways is made easier by the residual effects of the earlier connections. We get better at physical tasks because our signaling from intention to action has already been forged. It's not unlike a train track laid down through wild, inhospitable country. Future performances improve because your brain already knows the route and follows the track already laid down. Because your brain doesn't distinguish between doing something specific and just thinking about doing it, mental rehearsal lays down the tracks just as well as physical practice does. The nerves and muscles create a pathway just as sound as one produced through repeated performance. Nevertheless, there's one important difference between mental and physical practice. With physical practice, when you practice too much, you become fatigued, which causes electrical interference and blockage along the tracks. 
with mental intention, no roadblocks ever appear, no matter how much you practice in your head. To derive any benefit, mental rehearsal must replicate the real thing at normal speed. Although it might seem logical that a rehearsal would work best in slow motion, with particular attention to specific moves, that's not borne out by research. When skiers monitored by EMGs imagine their performance in slow motion, they produced a different muscle response pattern from that produced when carrying out the skill at ordinary speed. In fact, the brain muscle activity of rehearsing at slow motion is identical to the brain muscle pattern when the skiing itself is carried out in slow motion. This accords with what scientists understand about the neural patterns involved in slow motion compared with those of normal speed. The same task carried out in slow motion produces completely different neuromuscular patterning than when it is done at normal speed. There's also no such thing as cross-training in mental rehearsal. Intention facilitates just the type of athletic event that is being mentally rehearsed and is not transferable to other sports, even those involving similar muscle groups. This was apparent in a fascinating study involving sprinters. The researchers had divided a group of runners into four groups and asked them to do one of four types of preparation. To imagine themselves in a 40-meter sprint, to engage in power training on a stationary bicycle, to combine imagery and power training, or as the controls, to do no training in any form. After six weeks of training, the athletes were asked to perform two tests, to cycle their hardest while their effort was recorded on a cycle ergometer, which tests for cycling power, and to run a 40-meter sprint. Both activities require much the same motor ability and leg muscles. In the cycling test, those groups who had used power training alone showed improvement. However, when it came to the sprint, only the groups who had mentally practiced sprinting had significantly improved. Specific imagery enhances only the specific task that has been imagined. It did not simply build muscles generally. The motor neuron training was highly specific and only affected the actual performance visualized in the mind. Besides improving performance, mental intention can produce actual physiological changes, and not only in athletes' bodies. Guang Yu, an exercise psychologist at Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio, carried out research comparing participants who went to the gym with those who carried out a virtual workout in their heads. Those who regularly visited the gym were able to increase their muscle strength by 30%. But even those who remained in their armchairs and ran through a mental rehearsal of the weight training in their minds increased muscle power by almost half as much. Volunteers between 20 and 35 years old imagined flexing one of their biceps as hard as they could during daily training sessions carried out five times a week. After ensuring that the participants were not doing any actual exercise, including tensing their muscles, the researchers discovered an astonishing 13.5% increase in muscle size and strength after just a few weeks. Pure directed thought can give you the burn almost as well as any workout. Great news for couch potatoes out there. The kind of vivid visualizations techniques used by athletes are also highly affected in treating illness. Patients have boosted treatment of an array of acute and chronic conditions, according to studies, from coronary artery disease and high blood pressure to low back pain and musculoskeletal diseases, including fibromyalgia, by using mental pictures or metaphoric representations of their body fighting the illness. Visualization has also improved post-surgical outcomes, helping with pain management and minimizing the side effects of chemo. 
Indeed, the outcome of a patient's illness has been predicted by examining the types of visualizations and mental rehearsals used to combat them. A psychologist called Jean Achterberg, who healed herself of a rare cancer of the eye through this kind of imagery, went on to study a group of cancer patients who were using mental rehearsal to fight their own disease. She predicted with a 93% accuracy which patients would completely recover and which would get worse or die simply by examining their visualizations and rating them. Those who were successful had a greater ability to hold a vivid visual intention, imagining themselves overpowering the cancer and the medical treatment being effective. The successful patients also practiced their mental rehearsal regularly. So here's a little experiment to try, particularly if you don't like exercises. Choose a part of your body that you don't usually exercise. Let's say it's your upper arms. First, measure the circumference of each upper arm in between the elbow and the shoulder, the, the largest part of your bicep. Then several times a day, for five days a week, spend 10 minutes imagining yourself lifting weights and exercising your biceps. Imagine all of it with all your senses, particularly the feel of the weight in your arms. Remember, imagine it from your own perspective as though you're actually doing it, not watching yourself do it. After three weeks, measure the same place on both arms and see if your biceps have increased. Before I leave you, I'd like to invite you to join me on a journey in my Power of Eight Intention Masterclass 2020. I'm confident that it will heal your life, your health, your relationships, your finances or career, and even your life's purpose. I'm this confident because my program has healed the lives of thousands of people around the world, sometimes in just 10 minutes. Just once a year, I open my doors to students to show them the secrets of intention and the power of eight. I begin with a six-week live webinar course then place all the members of the class into groups of eight to meet for an entire year under my ongoing supervision. This year, we kick off on February 1st, 2020. I also know this works because my techniques have been subjected to scientific study by noted neuroscientists. Their studies have shown that participating in group intention causes major brainwave changes in people, the kind of changes that cause them to heal. To find out more, just visit my website, www.lynnmctaggart.com, and follow the link for the Power of Eight Intention Masterclass 2020. I hope to serve you next year and help you to heal your life. This is Lynn McTaggart, helping you to live the new science. Keep listening, and I'll continue to give you information and tips each time about how to incorporate this new information into your life.